Thank you, choir. I, I should have known better. I, I heard it the first time. <laughs> I should have known better. Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, um, thank you for your mercy. Uh, thank you for your love that um, generates your mercy and your justice because without either one, uh, we wouldn't be safe and we wouldn't be blessed. So thank you, Lord. And I pray, God, that we would, uh, that we'd be able to, um, today, to see truth from your word on this celebration of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to the church. Lord, I pray that all the blessings of Pentecost would be ours today and the empowerment that Acts 1-8 promises would be ours to experience and that we would, as a result, be an integral part of your great plan to establish your kingdom on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I'm intrigued by, uh, especially in the last couple of years when we've had all of the COVID and uh, politics and all of the craziness that goes with all of that and all the controversy and everything. And I'm intrigued by the fact that there's, at, at those kind of times, there's always a, a revival of conversation uh, among the church is everybody, well, you know, this we're living in the last days, the book of Revelation and whatever, whatever. And, and honestly, I've been hearing that my whole Christian life. Uh, you know, first it was the Cold War with Russia and all that. And I, I'm, every time, every few years when some big worldwide calamity comes along, then all of a sudden, you know, we're excited and boy, this is it. And I'm intrigued by that in light of the fact that the book of Revelation, for example, which is uh, a book that we'll talk a little bit about more next year, talk, talk more about in the year of the apostles, but the book of Revelation was written 2,000 years ago. There have been Christians for 2,000 years following Christ, and uh, it's been relevant for all of them for 2,000 years. And in every generation, there have been calamities and catastrophes for the past 2,000 years. But for example, in the first century, if you're a Christian and you're in the Roman Empire and you see people in your church or even your family members who are believers who will not recant their faith and they're dragged into the arena... And Romans throw them in with the lions and tigers and wild animals and they're mauled to death before your very eyes to entertain the crowds because simply because they follow Christ, you know, when, when's it going to get any worse? Um, Polycarp, the great bishop of Smyrna, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, if you've never read the account of the martyrdom of Polycarp and you want to get inspired and encouraged in your faith, read that account of, Par of when Polycarp was burned alive at the stake. Uh, read when that happened and, and how it happened and how God used it powerfully as a witness for Christ. I'm just saying that if you're living in those days and you ask, when, when does the tribulation come? When does the persecution come? You're going, well, I'm, <laughs> I think it's here as far as I'm concerned. Or even fast forward the tape a couple thousand years and get to the 1930s and 1940s. If you're living in Europe and you're a, a Jewish person or even a, a Christian who won't recant or compromise your faith and you see literally millions of people killed and incinerators filled with the bodies of people being burned alive simply because of their racial and ethnic background and the suffering 
You talk to people like Corey Ten Boom or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or those Christians that were a part of that, and you ask them, when, when's the persecution come? And, oh, by the way, we had a guy running that that would have been a, a, a great candidate for the Antichrist. <laughs> and there were not a few people that presumed that, along with Nero in the first century. And then, fast forward the tape till today. There's not one organization that assesses and evaluates persecution of Christians in the world that doesn't rank North Korea as the most dangerous place in the world by far to follow Christ right now. North Korea, there's not even a close second. Not even a close second. Um, and many of you remember I showed the video years ago. There was a, a recreation video. It wasn't the actual video of an alliance, Christian and Missionary Alliance missionary that was able to get into North Korea, and he had a contact there with a lady who was a believer. And, of course, they had to meet in public spaces to talk. They couldn't talk anywhere inside because everywhere was bugged. And she had made a contact with two young men who had decided to follow Christ. And this missionary, she brought him there so he could baptize them. And so the missionary took the young men into a hotel room. Nobody spoke because they couldn't speak. And he had written out the profession of faith on the toilet paper roll so he could throw it in the toilet when they were done. And he pulled it out, and after about the third question that they would respond to, both the men were weeping, and he couldn't take it anymore, and he... He just took water from the sink and splashed the water on them without saying a word. When he later left, the lady that he had been in his contact, they were leaving cold winter in North Korea. He was wearing gloves, and she shook his hand, and she said, May I have your gloves? And he said, Well, sure, because you know, it's cold here. She said, Well, I don't need them because I'm cold. These gloves have touched the doorknob of a church. My whole life, I have dreamed of being able to go to a church and worship Christ. And I have never had the chance. These gloves I will treasure because they've touched the doorknob of a church. I tell you what, if, if that doesn't sober you as an American Christian, you know, well, I don't feel like it today, you know, ball games on TV, and, you know, I'm tired. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ beside that woman. Or my friend Marcus, who's an Anglican bishop in Nigeria today, one of my classmates, and in his diocese, in his Nigerian diocese of the Anglican Church, showed me pictures that he had of parishioners in congregations that were under his leadership where the Boko Haram uh, terrorist had entered the church service with machetes. And people had been hacked to death because they dared to follow Christ openly. And Toby and Kirsten Hull, our missionaries in Burkina Faso today, Toby and Kirsten hopefully will be here at the end of the month, coming in for the Life Conference, bringing uh, missionary kids for the Life Conference. Toby and Kirsten are in Burkina Faso, and they cannot leave the city where they live right now. Toby would always travel in the countryside, visit the churches, encourage and minister, they can't do that because they'd be putting their life at risk. And they've been advised to stay in because the terrorism is so bad. Those are folks from our congregation that today are living in an environment where serving Christ risk is a risk to your own personal safety. So what I'm saying is, folks, there's never been a time when there hadn't been problems in the church. And I don't know how you pick one over another as to what constitutes 
the ultimate end time problem. I don't know how you do that because people have been doing it for 2,000 years. But A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance that God used to found the movement of which we're a part, when he was ministering in New York City, was once asked a question by a reporter from the New York Times. And the New York Times reporter asked him this question. Can you tell me when Christ will return again to this earth? He said, yes, I can. I can absolutely tell you, and I will tell you, if you promise me that you will print what I say word for word. You won't change a bit of it. The porter agreed, and he honored that. He did print it in the next day's edition of the Times. And A.B. Simpson quoted this verse, is what he quoted. The words of Jesus, read it with me. The, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. <laughs> Game over. That's an absolute statement by Jesus who says that the key to Jesus coming back to this earth that is absolutely clear is that when everybody who needs to hear has heard, he'll come back. That's the reason <clears throat> the late Keith Bailey was a pastor in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. In fact, he was the pastor that actually brought me into the Alliance, and he wrote a book once about the Alliance movement, and he appropriately titled it, Bringing Back the King. <laughs> Bringing Back the King. In other words, for a people who are devoted to making sure that everybody that needs to hear has heard, then the mission of those people is to see the return of Christ and the clear, gold standard, indisputable prophecy about the return of Christ is the spread of the message of Christ to everybody that needs to hear, according to Jesus. And Peter the Apostle even ramps this up and takes it to another level based on the truth of Jesus when in 2 Peter chapter 3, he is answering the question, why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Because all the first century church thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. <clears throat> and he's answering the question, why hasn't Jesus returned? And Peter says, in verse 8, he says, God is not slow, as some count slowness. In other words, God's really, he doesn't drag his feet, he doesn't delay, but is patient towards you, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. So Peter is saying, the reason Christ hasn't come back is he doesn't want anybody to unnecessarily be lost. He wants everybody to have a chance to hear about Jesus and receive the gift that Christ purchased for them at the cross. Now, moving forward, he says in verse 12, he says something even more remarkable. Peter says <clears throat> that we, by the way we live our lives, have the ability to hasten that day. <laughs> In other words, if we get on with the job, it'll happen sooner. So you see, <clears throat> the gold standard I would submit to you with regard to prophecy as to when Christ will return and set up His kingdom is when the church finishes the job. When the church finishes the job. then Christ will return, according to Christ and according to the Apostle Peter. But even more so, that is even more evident when we look at and drill down even further into what the Bible says about the sharing of the good news with the Jewish people. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the good news of the Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is believing both to Jew first and to Greek. 
<clears throat> Greek there meaning a metonymy for Gentile. <clears throat> so in other words, there's a priority of Jewish people hearing the good news. And what's the consequence of that priority? Well, Peter preaching in the temple in Acts chapter 3, very short time after Jesus has ascended back to heaven and the Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> Peter is preaching in the temple, and he says to the Jewish people there in the temple these words, Therefore, repent and turn back, so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. What? Look at what Peter's saying to these people. If you will turn to Jesus, he'll come back. He's talking about more than anybody Peter knew he'd already been here once. Peter's talking about the second coming. And he's saying to the Jewish people, if you will accept him as Messiah, he will return. Furthermore, that explains why Paul elaborates in Romans that there's been a partial hardening in Israel. In other words, God has, has partially removed His grace to believe from Jewish people to, to, give them the, to give the Gentiles the ability to hear. It says there's a partial hardening in Israel until a full number of Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel will be saved. So... <clears throat> Whether it's Jew or Gentile, whether it's Jew or Gentile, the key to the return of Christ is the spreading of the good news to the people who haven't heard and haven't responded to Christ. A.B. Simpson, as a footnote, speaking about that scripture in Romans 1 and Peter's words in Acts 3 about the priority of Jewish evangelism says, To the Jews, therefore, everywhere the gospel was to be presented first, and this is still its message and its scope. The Gentile portion of the Christian church has largely forgotten its sacred trust to Christ's kindred according to the flesh. See, in other words, what he's saying that the Gentiles have pretty much ignored the Jews' need to know about Christ. But they are absolutely critical to not be ignored along with anybody else who hadn't heard in order for Christ to return. <coughs> now, you know, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, because of this value system, excuse me, I'm, my throat is giving me some trouble this morning. <coughs> the Christian and Missionary Alliance because of our commitment to this priority, when we send out missionaries to various ministries around the world, we have a formula that we use to, to guide our, our efforts. And it's a formula whereby uh, we use demographic people like the Joshua Project to help with these, this information. If there's 5% or less of the population that are professing Christians, in other words, that means any kind of Christian or claim to be Christian, if there's 5% or less, they're deemed an unreached people group. If they're 2% or less of evangelicals, in other words, people who are, are, are people like we here at DAC who believe that a personal commitment to Jesus Christ and a personal trust in Him as our sin bearer and Savior. He died on the cross, He rose again, and that we, for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life, would turn to Christ and seek His uh, forgiveness and cleansing and so forth. So, <clears throat> if there's 2% or less in the population of th that are in that category, then they're deemed unreached. In other words, they're incapable of reaching their own people. So those would be the categories of people where we send missionaries because we believe the priority needs to be those who haven't heard and those who aren't following Christ. Now, with that being said, 
<clears throat> and with the idea that the return of Christ is indelibly tied to the spreading of the good news of Christ to the whole world, then 16 years ago when I prayed for a word from God for the ministry here to explain what God wanted to do among us, God gave me Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, that passage is a prophecy that Jesus gave to the disciples, and he said, <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, today is the day of Pentecost, the anniversary of the Holy Spirit being given to the church, that the byproduct of the Spirit of God in your life as a believer is that He's going to make you like Jesus in such a way that you're going to give evidence that Jesus is real and alive. And Jesus is going to live His life through you. It's called eternal life. And He's going to prove Himself alive through you to other people by the way you love them and by the way you love Him. And... <clears throat> I'd summarize this verse, and my understanding of it is that we brag on Jesus in everything we do. In other words, in everything we do, Christ comes out. And people are exposed to Christ through us by the power of the Holy Spirit, as God is faithful in that. And notice it says, not just Jerusalem, that means the people across the street from you, starting with the people in your living room, your own family. You know, back to this issue of the whole world being evangelized, um, everybody's got an opinion. I got three. And uh, my, one of my opinions is that <clears throat> I believe that we'd be living in the kingdom if Christians had made a priority of historically evangelizing their families. Because some of the most unreached places in the world today used to be the most Christian places in the world, uh, i.e., North Africa, the Middle East all those areas were the center of Christianity in the first centuries. Somebody dropped the ball. Now, <clears throat> that being said, it's not just Jerusalem, but it says Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. By the way, most Bibles say ends. You know I'm a word nerd. E-N-D-S, it is not plural in the original. It's end, singular. And I think that's significant, but anyway. I won't get off on that rabbit trail. But, but where I'm headed with this is this, is that, yes, we have the capacity for our family and our neighbors and our friends and our associates to be Christ to them. But what about the people that live on the other end of the earth? What do we do about them? Well, that's why we send people and support people, and that's why many of us go. And at the same time the Lord quickened this scripture to my heart 16 years ago, at the same time the Lord just planted in me the idea, it was really wishful thinking and hope. I really wouldn't say that it would. I just said, man, Lord, wouldn't it be neat if we had Alliance missionaries that went out from our church so that when we do the support for the missionaries, because in the Christian Missionary Alliance, we support corporately. We don't support missionaries individually. We support them corporately, corporately, one fund that supports the missionaries when they're sent out. Wouldn't it be great if we had missionaries from our church that we would build that support around that were organically a part of DAC? Well, at that time, we didn't have anybody in that category. We didn't have anybody in that category. You see, we give to Christ. We give to Christ when we give to support a missionary. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want to give to an individual. I want to give to Christ. Because those individuals are serving Christ in His great work of reaching everybody in the world. And so, as we do that, how is God using us to fulfill prophecy? Well, several ways. And I want to change the slide just a little bit. Um, the, the next slide after that one, for those in the booth, I'm going to save it for in a minute, okay? We're going to jump over that one for now. Is 
how is God using us and how is God working to fulfill Acts 1 8 among us? Well, much to my delight and surprise, we didn't have anybody 16 years ago, but today, let's watch some videos. First, let's hear a one minute video from Josh and Rachel Ellison. Rachel is Daryl and Cheryl Fennessy's daughter. Notice the country they're serving in, they're not mentioning. There's a reason for that. But they're serving internationally with the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Let's meet them. If you haven't already. You say hi. Hi. We are Josh and Rachel, and uh, we have three kids serving here in uh, this beautiful city by the Red Sea. And uh, some people consider this a hard place to live, and they're not too wrong. Uh, but you know, there's a, we see a lot of light in the, in the midst of the darkness here. Uh, there's a lot of people who are seeking Him and wishing to know truth and fighting through uh, a lot of, of the baggage that their, their past, that the, the majority of religion has uh, put in their lives. And so thank you for your guys' support and continuing to pray for us as we continue to be salt and light in this part of the world. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And um, then we also have another video from Matt and Stephanie Stein. And you might remember her as Stephanie Solar. Okay? And we just had a team come back from ministering with them at the Envision ministry site in Atlanta where there are thousands of refugees that are moving to that area from various parts of the world. And they've got a very ingenious and very creative ministry that they have up there that they're reaching out to these refugees. So let's meet them. Hi, DAC family. We had a great uh, 2021 here on the farm. We had, uh, <clears throat> it started from snuffing and built an entire farm. We had about 400 refugees come out, and it was an incredible year. Uh, so looking into the next year, even though we're kind of a month and a half already into it, uh, but we're excited for more this year. We're, we're excited for more refugee involvement. We're excited for more relationships to be built through the farm. We're excited for more animals. We have 22 baby goats scheduled to be born this spring, so we're very excited about that. Uh, we have plans to build a big barn to bring bring on another uh, staff member with us. Uh, we're very excited for all this. Uh, so yeah. And we just want to express our gratitude to you. Uh, we love you, church family. Thank you for your prayer support. Thank you for your financial support. You're the reason we can keep doing what we're doing and doing what God has called us to do. We love you, um, and we hope that you follow along in our journey this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amen. And then... <clears throat> we have Toby and Kirsten Hall. As I mentioned earlier, hopefully they'll be with us in a few weeks. And they're in Africa. We just saw them a few weeks ago over there. So let's hear from Toby and Kirsten. Hi, we're Toby and Kirsten Hall serving in West Africa as part of your alliance, your Dalton Alliance family. Hey, and yeah, we just want to say thank you for all you do for us, uh, partnering with us as we serve the Lord here in West Africa. Thanks for how you supported us in so many different ways, giving to our compensation pools we can be here, giving to ministry projects, to giving to all these different things, and for praying for us. We thank you so much for your faithfulness and partnering with us here as we serve the Lord. Yeah, we've been really busy the last couple of months in ministry with teaching, Bible school, uh, construction projects, girls' school. It's been a lot going on, but it's been a good time. Yeah, yeah, just last week I was able to help with a conference that we put on for some of our church leaders and pastors out in one of the missionary zones in the south of our country. And uh, it was a theme was on prayer, and the idea is to just uh, have a revived church to reach a lost world. Uh, that was the theme behind the conference. And I got a call from one of the pastors saying, thank you for helping, helping us have this teaching, helping us this training. It's exactly what we needed. So uh, because of you, we're able to do that kind of stuff. So thank you so much, Delton Alliance Church. We love you, and God bless. And then, Ross and Ashley Ballard, who served with us as missionary interns for uh, uh, several years, and they're now deployed in France. And uh, here's a greeting from them. I especially appreciated the French uh, wardrobe, if you'll take notice. 
Hey, Deltona Alliance Church, this is Ross and Ashley Ballard coming to you from Albertville, France, where we are now in our second trimester of French Language School. Ashley, I heard that we reached our 2021 support goal. Is there something you wish to share with the church? Absolutely. We just wanted to come and thank you guys so much uh, for the support of DAC. We had our support goal for 2021 completely fulfilled. Um, and the largest part of that was met by your giving from DAC. We are blown away by your support through your prayers, through your giving, through your emails and your correspondence. And we just wanted to come and say that we love you guys. That we're so grateful for this family that we're a part of. And we miss you guys bunches. So, Agreed, church. Thank you so much. And congratulations. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well... 16 years ago, we didn't have anybody we could put on that video. Look what God has done. Look how faithful God is. And it doesn't end there. Because as Ross and Ashley just finished an internship with us, understand that in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, somebody that is going to be a missionary, that they first have to have theological training, and then they're given a preliminary approval for ministry, a credentialing, and then they become a part of a, like a two-year process of ministry whereby it's, it's, it's really a, a training and a qualification process. In other words, the idea is if you're going to send somebody internationally to serve, it's better for them to have a track record of service and serve here at home. If there are going to be complications or problems, it's better that they show up here than after they've been sent halfway across the world, and that's harder on everybody. So we have a two-year process of internship whereby their gifts and abilities and the confirmation of their calling is confirmed, and Ross and Ashley finished that. But in addition then to them, to those that are serving we're supporting, we also have Jared and Kristen Jacobs, whom you know and have met, that are serving with us now as missionary interns. And then also in the last couple of weeks, we've had newly credentialed and confirmed missionary interns, Daniel, who's going to stand up right now, Daniel and Kara Stringer, who are also now missionary interns with us, and Karis couldn't be here because she worked all night last night at the hospital, and she wants to be here for the dinner and everything tonight, and so she's sleeping right now. <clears throat> But look what God is doing. Isn't that exciting? And the point is that not only do we have those four missionaries that we're supporting, those four couples that we're supporting through the alliance giving that's over and above, that's specified on your offering envelope right now as Great Commission Fund, but guess what we're changing that to? As of July 1st, that's going to have a different name. It's going to be the A.B. Simpson offering. And when you give a dollar to that A.B. Simpson offering, it's going to be divided among all those that are serving through our church and then additionally given to others who serve, but specifically to them and then also to support generally what makes up the majority of their salary. Don't ask me to explain. It's kind of confusing. Just get it this way. You give a dollar to that, it's going to everybody to get it done. It's going to everybody to get it done. And to fulfill Christ's prophecy for this world and God's will for this world for everybody to have a chance to hear. But then it doesn't end there. We as a church, we have people that are organically connected, that are physically a part of DAC, who serve with other mission agencies. And we want to support them as well. We don't want to confuse the offerings. So the A.B. Simpson offering is for the Alliance missionaries that serve through our denomination, the Alliance, but other missionaries that serve outside of the Alliance are supported through our church budget. And we're the sending church for Jerry and Joyce McDaniels, and they're one of those couples that are included in that. I've got, they're in the back, but there's their picture on the front, so you can see them better on the picture, right? But there's Jerry and Joyce that are in... So every time you give to the general fund, 
you give to them. That's how we corporately support them. And also, Laura Myers, who's from our church. There's Laura in the back. Hey, Laura. Yeah, there she is. And we support her as well. Both of them serve with Ethnos 360. So every time you give to the general fund of the church, then you are corporately supporting them. So understand that as you support these workers that are faithfully going to unreached people around the world, we are participating in Christ's great end-time plan to spread the message of Him to everybody and to receive Jesus come back. So what I'd like to ask you to do is two things. First of all, recognize how critical you are in this process. Recognize how critical you are and what a privilege you have from God to do this. So every time that you to give to the A.B. Simpson offering or to the general fund of the church, pray that God will use it to bring back the king. And be gratified to know that that's what he's doing with that. And recognize that your role is not insignificant. We had Matt and Stephanie Stein up there. We had Ross and Ashley Ballard up there, right? Okay. You heard Dave Crouch earlier share his story and how he went as a young boy. His mother took them to a church in Pennsylvania, right? All right. That's how he came to Christ. Well, later on, Dave and Patty... They, their daughter Pam and her husband Ken Solar, their daughter Stephanie is now serving internationally with the Alliance, right? Because she was exposed to the church because his mother decided one day to take them to church. But also Ross and Ashley Ballard are on there, right? Well, guess how that happened? Pam worked with Ashley's mother years ago and one day at work just said, I'd like to invite you to go to church with me. And the rest of the story is that her daughter and her husband are now one of our couples serving internationally with CMA. you have any idea just how a simple invite that God can use that? Look at that. Don't discredit the significance of just you loving people in the name of Jesus and how He'll use it. You are God's plan to reach the world.